Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Woodstock Film Festival Film and Conversation. And this time, I'm, I'm Ira Blaustein, your invisible uh, host. Uh, or invisible, rather, <laughs> rather uh, host. Um, and we're here with John Sloss. I just want to say a couple of things about John before um, we get him talking. Um, I first met John, or at least knew of John in the late 90s, uh, when he was really, if I'm not mistaken, John, uh, of mainly uh, entertainment lawyer. And his firm actually represented a film that I made and was very helpful. Um, that was back in the 90s, in the past few decades, John's company grew leaps and bounds and now they basically took over the entertainment world, uh, at least the independent in the, uh, entertainment world. So um, I'm going to ask John if you can give us a little bit of an overview of the trajectory between uh, from the time that you, you had just um, Slot um, the legal firm to the kind of like empire that you have now. Yeah, well, that's very kind of you, Mayor. Um, and yes, you are right. Uh, I, uh, when we first met, I was definitely focused on being a lawyer. Uh, I still am a partner uh, in a law firm that is the sort of largest purely transactional entertainment firm in New York, at least. Um, but what happened? Uh, when I started working with John Sales, actually, as a lawyer, I recognized that um, that the the producers who were getting um, films made were the ones who were good at raising money, not necessarily the ones who were good at producing films. And that seemed like uh, an an inefficiency to me. So, uh, and I thought, well, I'm negotiating as a lawyer all day with um, the uh, financiers and distributors. So I know the people who finance movies. Why don't I go to my producer clients, the ones who are good producers, and say, uh, how about letting me take a stab at raising the financing for the film so that you can focus on producing? Um, they, of course, said, certainly, because no one likes raising money, going hat in hand, door to door. Um, so I started doing that. The first film I did it on was a John Sales film called City of Hope. Um, I raised the money. Uh, I got an executive producer credit. We uh, got the film financed. Uh, we shot the film and then someone had to sell it. And I came from a family of salesmen and uh, I said, well, let me take a, a crack at selling it. So I, we, we took it to a festival, we showed it and we sold it. And I started doing, I started getting a reputation as a lawyer who was more proactive than other lawyers. Uh, and so I kept, so that business kept growing. And since it's not strictly the practice of law, I branded it with another name, which is Synetic, um, and basically made it a separate parallel company. Um, and that is the company that, we're, that has grown uh, pretty significantly over the past 20 years, I would say. Um, yes, I remember um, when you handled uh, Little Miss Sunshine, uh, produced by Peter Sarab, who was uh, um, uh, with us uh, here just a few days ago. And I was in Sundance at the time at your party. Synetic was throwing this party in, in the Sundance. Uh, so downstairs was the party and upstairs, you, you were up there with the buyers uh, selling the film for the biggest sale that ever existed in Sundance at the time. So yeah, that was a, that was a pretty heady moment, I must say. <laughs> it, yeah, it was it was pretty incredible. I um I would like to encourage, by the way, the attendees um to type in your question. Um, I would love to put, for John to talk about films like uh, Boyhood. Uh, Boys Don't Cry, uh, Before Sunrise, and also the specific, the filmmakers that uh, he had worked with throughout uh, the years and stayed very close with, like Richard Linklater or Kevin Smith. Um, who, who did you really start with? Was it, I mean, and, other and, than- And a lot, of, a lot of documentaries, you know, I've been focusing a lot on documentaries over the past few years and as they've kind of become more prominent. Um, who did I really start with? 
Is that the question? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, outside of John Sayles. Uh, I mean, you know who I really started with and who I can never give enough credit to is John Pearson. Um, John Pearson was a friend of mine. He was, uh, not everyone, maybe some of the people tuning into this know who he is, but he's a true hero of independent film. And he was the first real producer's representative. Uh, he's not a lawyer. He didn't really like negotiating deals. He liked selling films. He liked getting buyers, uh, raising, you know, shining a light on filmmakers and getting buyers excited. And uh, we got along very well. Uh, and he started repping these films. And he, for instance, um, Kevin Smith, uh, Clerks was a film. He, he right. may not have ever seen The Light of Day without him. Uh, Spike Spike Lee, she's got to have it. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, Michael Moore's Roger and Me, uh, Rose Trochet's film Go Fish, um, <clears throat> and another one, Slacker. And Slacker uh, was a, a film that he found at the IFP market and loved it uh, and believed in it. And he introduced me to the filmmaker, young Richard Linkletter, in, uh, who came by. My, uh, I, at that point, it was before I left my, I was at a big corporate firm being an entertainment lawyer. So I was in this gigantic glass tower on the uh, 50th floor and out walks this, walks this guy with cut off jeans and you know, sort of an aw shucks attitude. Uh, and he was the genius who is Richard Linkletter. Um, and I, I worked on the distribution deal of Slacker, which was no small feat because we had to take that movie and, make, and turn it and get contracts from you know the 50 characters in it and make it deliverable. And he and I um, have grown to be very close and I've worked with him ever since and been an executive producer and producer on, on virtually every film he's made since then. Right, how is he, what is he working on now? He just wrapped a film, in fact. <clears throat> it's called Apollo 10 and a Half. Oh. Um, it is a fantasy about a nine-year-old boy uh, during the period of the moon landing in 1969. And he shot it live action and it is being animated in the style of Waking Life and Scanner Darkly. Oh. Um, and um, that's happening over in, in Holland uh, and it's still happening even though everyone's sort of, you know, isolated in their homes. Uh, it, it, as it turns out, animation is something that actually can proceed during this period. Absolutely. I have a couple of questions I want to start asking from uh, our attendees. So Claudia Mordock um, is asking, um, we are approaching the end of the production of a narrative feature, which we will have shot over the course of a year. How can we maximize our chances of finding support for the film getting into high quality festivals and eventually finding distribution for it? Well, if you have enough money to finish the film, I would encourage you to do that and to do it uh, as well as you humanly can because no matter who you have on your side, no matter how good your luck is, there's no substitute for making the best film you possibly can with what you have. So I would encourage you to push yourself as far as possible in that regard. Uh, if you have a film that's a festival film, um, I would take stock of the festivals where films are sold. Uh, you'll start getting contacted by people like Sony Classics and other people who would like you to show them your film uh, before a festival. I would really discourage that. Um, you, if you start letting the air out of the balloon, you'll end up with a, uh, more often than not with a deflated balloon. So what you need to do is align yourself with someone who sort of knows that business. I mean, this sounds self-interested because it's what I do, um, but align yourself with a knowledgeable agent, sales agent, someone who understands how to do distribution deals. It may be your film isn't best suited for a festival, uh, you know, uh, or there's certain festivals for which it's best suited but I would really, sooner rather than later, and I would say before you finish the film, align yourself with a reliable, um, you know, experienced sales agent. 
Okay, thank you very much. I have another question here from uh, Veronica Miles. And she asks, what advice do you have for emerging filmmakers when navigating the early days of their careers? And she says also, I'm a producer on a doc that's synthetic represented called General Magic. So thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, yes, well, my advice, uh, it depends, you know, whether you're a producer, director, writer, or all three. Um, this is still, even in the age of isolation and the internet, uh, a business of relationships. Uh, and I would uh, blow through any inherent shyness or introversion and get to know the people in the business. And don't gravitate necessarily toward the people who flatter you. Do your homework, find out who has integrity, find out who has taste, find out who is respected. Um, you know, people get uh, a little concerned about, you know, what kind of representative should I have? Should I have a manager? Should I have an agent? Should I have a lawyer? Um, my answer to that, and I think it's one everybody should take on board, is that it is so hard in this business to cut through all of the noise that if you can find someone, no matter what they call themselves, and no matter how many of them there are, who is respected, who understands your vision and your, your talent, and who is willing to throw down uh, for you, then hire that person. Um, it, it, they really do have to have experience and be respected, and they have to sort of have all these components and really believe in you. But if you do, you could have two managers. You could have a manager, an agent, and a lawyer. It doesn't matter. Uh, if you're worried about the difference between keeping 85% and 75% or 90% or even 100% of what you do, uh, then you're focusing on the wrong thing. Um, it's hard enough to make it, and when you make it, um, you're, you'll be making so much more uh, that 75% of what you make will dwarf 100% of what you would have made if you hadn't had the right people uh, representing you. Thanks, and thanks, Veronica. I have another question here from um, Sage Higgins. And she's asking, um, she says, I know, I know the experience of shooting Boyhood was definitely a unique one. What challenges did you face in this very long, um, 12 years, if I'm not mistaken, uh, process? Well, the, the, the challenge that I faced, like, Richard Linkletter faced his own challenges. You know, um, his, you know his, his challenge to all of us was he wanted to do a film about the period from kindergarten through high school. Uh, he, he didn't want to cast different actors as the same character. Um, uh, so he didn't really know uh, how to do that. And he got frustrated and finally said, I'm gonna sit down and write a novel. And he sat down and then he said, wait, actually, why don't I cast this movie and make it you know, uh, 10 minutes a year, basically worth of film, over 12 years with the same cast. Uh, and he came to me and said, this is what I want to do. Um, you know, the whole idea of film as a business uh, requires, you know, traditional metrics for investment. Like you invest money, you uh, look for a return. Uh, you realize that you're, you're, you know, you try to keep your money out as, as short a period as possible and get your get money back quickly. Um, the idea that this film, would, that the people invested in it would not have a chance to begin to recoup their investment for 12 years made it a very hard sell. Um, we ended up getting IFC to finance it, which is a miracle. And it's really due to this guy named Jonathan Searing, uh, another Woodstock Film Festival honoree, I might add. Um, and uh, he, uh, he convinced his corporation to take this chance. And what I did, I guess my real contribution to this was I created a structure uh, that they found acceptable. And that is, I rather than committing them to fund all 12 years uh, up front, we made it a series of 12 one-year options. And after each year, we'd go back to them next year, the next year and say, are you going to fund the money for this year? And uh, 
they would either say yes or no. And if they said no, we had the right to take the film to other investors and to put IFC's investment in the back behind those investors. So they had a, an inducement to, to exercise the option every year, but they weren't obligated to. As it turns out, they did exercise it every year. Um, and we got, you know, that was just a charmed project. The, the other thing is that by law, you're not allowed to bind people to personal services contracts for more than six years. So after six years, any of the actors in this movie could have just said, we're not, I'm not showing up or I'll show up for a million dollars. And that was a, that was a real leap of faith that Rick took, that the financier took, that we all took. And Rick is the kind of person you would kind of, you would take that uh, leap of faith on because he is incredibly charismatic. He does things for the right reason. And he was smart enough to cast the right people. And, and clear, one of them we weren't worried about because it was his daughter. Mm. Um, but the, the other three, and Ethan Hawke was a pretty good bet. Uh, but Patricia Arquette and Eller Coltrane, uh, Eller was, you know, five when we started. Um, and he showed up every year and just brought it. Uh, so I would say those were the challenges. It, it's amazing that, uh, I mean, other than the funding, that, you, that all those actors were able to commit themselves to a specific time of the year, I suppose, over the course of that many I mean, years. Well, there was flexibility and we worked around people's schedules. It, it didn't happen on the same weekend every year. But, you know, Rick didn't know Patricia Arquette. He just thought she was right for it. And he had one phone conversation with her and basically took that ride with her and she took that ride with him based on one conversation. Right, well, um, so I have another question here from, uh, and I hope I'm not butchering your name, Tivoli Silas um, is um, the name and he's asking, he's a director, so he's asking as a director, which is the best way to find producers for your film? Would submitting a film to the be uh, blacklist and contest would be best, or pitching, or both? Uh, can you address that a little bit? I would say the best way is to hang around the Woodstock Film Festival. <laughs> okay, be a little bit more real. All right, okay, sorry. Um, uh, I think, but I mean, a version of that, I do think this is a business of relationship. I, I think the idea that you're gonna show up and find the right producer for you right off the bat is is not necessarily the right way to do it. I think, uh, and this is a piece of advice I give people all the time. Um, people tend to gravitate toward people who want them. Um, I think the better course of action is to do your homework and figure out who you want. Uh, because the person who wants you isn't necessarily the right person for you. Um, and so I would really make these relationships. I would study and find out who the producers with good reputations are. What kind of producer are they? Uh, do they work well with filmmakers? You know, are they, are they a financier's producer in that they defend the financier or do they default to the filmmaker or do they tread the ground in the middle where I think the best producers are? Um, and are they, uh, are they, uh, you know, uh, compatible with you and what you want to do? And you got to kiss a few frogs. You should not assume that the first person you you uh, you know talk to or you know or even think about being with or even do your first film with is is a person you're wedded to in that regard. So um, I would really, really, if this is the career you've chosen, you know, as a I, I love to say this saying, even though it was said to me, Oliver Platt said to me once, and he, he said it about actors, but I think it's true about our end of the business in so many different ways. He said, if you have to decide whether you want to be an actor or not, you shouldn't bother. Um, and I think that's true of all of us. And if you want, because, and I tell all the people I work with at the, uh, um, that, um, everyone at Synetic and the law firm even could make more money doing something else. So there has to be a component of passion to what you do. If you, if you're, it's so competitive in the film industry and so hard 
that you, you have to really have no choice. It is your calling. And if that's the case, then you have to put in the work. You have to put in the research. You owe it to yourself to, uh, to get as smart as you can because, uh, you know, you can have an agent, you can have everything. Uh, no one knows you as well as you know yourself. And, and if you trust your instincts, uh, you will find the right people. If you put the work in, you'll find the right people to associate with. That's very, very good advice. Thank you. Um, I have, um, I'm debating between this. I, ha I have a question here that is a little bit of an extension of what you said, or at least uh, related to that. So I'll take that and first, and that comes from an anonymous attendee. And he or she um, saying that if you have made short films and want to direct your own feature script, how can you leverage a short film in festival, etc., to help position yourself to get the opportunity to make your own full length film? Well, it used to be much harder. Um, um, but now, now short films are really good resumes for feature films. And a lot of that is because is because the as the studio system has started to break down and it has over the last 20 years uh, the agencies have put more and more stock in discovering filmmakers they don't wait for someone else to discover them and then poach them they they realize that they have to get them at the inception so sometimes for instance at Sundance the toughest ticket is the shorts program and because and you go there it's all these really sort of snappily dressed people with, you know, 40 watt smiles and, um, or 400 watt smiles, I guess 40 watts, not that much of a smile. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and so you really get a fair shot when you make shorts. Um, the other uh, thing is that buyers or many platforms have come to realize that the statue they give you at the Oscars for shorts is identical to the statue they give you for best picture. And so, <laughs> A lot of people are uh, are focusing on short films. They've never been more in demand than they are today. And plus, with places like Quibi that just started yesterday, um, and other platforms, you know, the idea that that you know the Netflix did with House of Cards, where they put a 12-hour TV show on the air at once, or, or you know, they 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 put they you know. Um, they put it on Netflix at once and you can sit and watch it for 12 hours a night they put it on, I think has sort of um, liberated people from this idea that, you know, episodic things are a half hour or an hour, features are, you know, 90 minutes to three hours. Uh, I think people now are getting accustomed to watching uh, narratives of whatever length they are. And if you can tell a story with a beginning, middle, and end in, in 10 minutes or eight minutes, uh, then that's what you should do. You're, you're kind of liberated to choose the length that your story demands, and people will see it. Thank you. I have a very um, totally different question, but very timely, uh, from Denise Grayson, and it's something that all of us, I think, are uh, pondering these days. She say, uh, she's asking, I'm guessing that films in post-production are relatively safe now at this tender time during COVID-19. What do you foresee the immediate landscape to look like fiscally? I mean, she's really talking about the money part of it. Um, fiscally, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about this <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're on these video conferences internally from our remote locations all day. And, you know, here's what I, I, here's what I would say. I don't have a crystal ball, but there are two facts that are inescapable. There are three facts. One, theaters are not open. Uh, two, production has shut down completely. Um, three, the platforms that are exploding, like Netflix and Disney, and HBO Max, and even HBO, which is a platform, or Peacock, or Apple, or, or Amazon, we're all counting on the production that was in place, that was, that was in process. That is shut down. And at the same time, everybody's trapped in their homes, consuming more content than ever. So at a breakneck pace, 
people are going through the entire uh, menus of their of their platforms that they <clears throat> that they follow, and the platforms realize they got nothing coming out because all the production stopped. So if you the logic from that is that if you have a piece of content that is deliverable, that's finished or in post, and you can finish it, then if you're patient for the next few weeks until the platforms wake up and start panicking, then you should have opportunities to sell beyond what you have ever had before. I have no proof that that's going to happen, but I don't see how um, it could be avoided. How many projects um, are you yourself sitting on now waiting to be able to move them? 40. Oh my God, seriously? Yeah, oh. films. We had films that we that that never that that didn't get sold out of Toronto and of Sundance. We had the films we were going to take to South by. We had the films we were going to take to Tribeca. Okay. And we, you know, we have films we were submitting to Cannes and and oh. films that were just being finished for you know the fall festivals. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. Um, I have um, a very specific question now. I'm completely shifting the, uh, to another subject from Avery Davenport, and he's, uh, he's um, asking, he's talking about boyhood. I mean, boys don't cry, but, uh, but sorry. He says, transgender rights wasn't really at the forefront of civil rights conversation when Boys Don't Cry released two decades ago. Yet the film was a huge critical success and won an Oscar. What elements of the project made it worth it to take the risk? Um, you know, uh, Kimberly Pierce, who wrote and directed that film, uh, is a force of nature. She is, um, she is not a person, uh, to say no to. She, uh, she is very persuasive. She's very talented and very persuasive. You know, she doesn't work enough, but, you know, that you could take that up with her. Um, uh, she found, um, she came up at a time, she found Christine Vachon, which is always a good person to have on your side. And that was at a time when, um, you know, when John Hart and Jeff Sharp had money from investors and were investing in films like this. Uh, and Hilary Swank, you know, no one really knew her, but uh, she was clearly a force. You know, it was a leap of faith. It was a very low budget film. It was a leap of faith. Uh, you know, the first cut, I, I'm speaking a little bit out of school and I'm sure Kimberly will hunt me down and kill me. So I would prefer that you not tell this, but there was, <laughs> there was something very interesting that happened with this movie. Uh, and it's really instructive. Um, first of all, I, I saw a very long version of the film like, you know, close to three hours. And we decided to cut, but we said the performance was so astonishing. We decided to cut a reel when people weren't doing that back then, you know, like a 10 minute reel of select scenes uh, and take it to distributors. Uh, and so my job was to sell the film. We all worked on the reel, we cut it. Uh, we, we took it to a number of places. I took it to Lindsay Law, who was then the head of Fox Searchlight which was um, before uh, Peter Rice was and before Nancy Utley and Steve DeLula are now. Um, I showed him the five minutes. He had been in American Playhouse. He understood um, this kind of storytelling and he bought it on the spot like that. Um, we, del we, we delivered a very long film that wasn't there yet and Kimberly was having a hard time finding, you know, she fell in love with a lot of the material and the film was just too long. It wasn't its best version. And Lindsay Law had a suggestion that I will never forget. And, uh, and it was, um, take this film and cut a 90 minute version of it. Be ruthless. Uh, and then once you've done that, you will find what you cannot live without. Um, and Kimberly, to her credit, did that. Uh, and she was smart enough to realize what should be in that 90 minutes and what she couldn't live without. Uh, and 
That turned out to be the final version of the film, and it's one we're all obviously very proud of. Uh, excellent advice. Um, thank you. So I have a question um, from Christopher Schiller, and it's kind of like um, a do-over question. If you were starting out again now, branching out from entertainment attorney to producing, and were able to give yourself advice from your current experience that you were unaware of when you started, what would that be? Um, I got a very, I've gotten a lot of good advice along the way. Um, you know, when I was a young entertainment attorney, um, the, guy, the guy who trained me, I was, I was very, uh, my era will, will um, attest to this. I was, I, I'm an excitable person. I can be forceful. I can, uh, you know, n I'm not, I don't know, I've got a lot of energy. Uh, and one of the pieces of advice that the guy trained me said, John, try to be more gray. <laughs> I think now I'm obliging him. But, um, <laughs> but uh, so that was a piece I took on board. Um, but in the middle of my career, when I was having a fair amount of success, I was, I was complaining about something to someone one day, and, and this person who was very successful themselves said, John, why do you spend a minute working with people you don't want to work with? And that's a very interesting question because you get caught up in chasing money, you get caught up in chasing success, but what you realize is You've got a limited number of years, a limited amount of time on this planet, and you know the quality of your life is more, certainly more important than money. You know, money informs it, but people tend to lose the their perspective on that. Um, you know, what good is making a lot of money if you're miserable? That's it's like that's like a cruel joke. Um, and um, the tricky thing about it is that along the way, you'll find people who are immensely talented, but who, excuse my French, are assholes. Um, and that's trickier because if you want to leave a legacy on this world, if, you, if you're doing this for the reason a lot of us are doing it, it's to facilitate great art. Uh, and sometimes you're lucky enough to meet people like Rick Linkletter, who is a prince and a genius. and Sometimes you meet other people who I won't name, who are immensely talented, but who you feel guilty working with. Um, and uh, so I guess I'm sort of, you know, modulating my own advice, but I wouldn't assume while you're doing it that the people that you have to work with the people you're working with. And sometimes maybe you need to take a step back and say, is this the right direction? Are these the right people? Very, very, very good advice. And something that I've actually told myself different ways a um, long time ago. Um, so this is, um, it's a question that more or less in the same realm uh, from uh, David Peck. And he's, ask, he's asking, um, any thoughts on finding a distributor or insights on submitting, submitting a doc, a documentary, to the festival circuit in this uncertain time and with regard to the COVID backlog of films? Yeah, I mean, the real question is when, I, I would probably stay away now from virtual festivals that, that are being mounted um, because mm -hmm. I, I don't know how they're gonna work. And you know, once you, you, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression, once you put your film up and people see it, that's it. So it's really incumbent upon you to find the best way to present it. Um, so the first question is, when are film festivals going to begin again? You know, is it going to be Telluride, Toronto, and Venice? Um, we'll see. Um, so there's that. The second is, yes, uh, there's going to be, there's a backlog of, of docs that were in South By and, uh, and uh, Tribeca. Um, a lot of those are going to go to those festivals, and if those festivals don't happen, they'll go to Sundance. Uh, a lot of the films that were being that are being that would be made for Sundance are not being made now. They they stopped production. So I would say that if the fall festivals are happening, then then if you've got a film that's ready for Sundance, you might be in better shape than you could possibly have been. 
um, because a lot of the films that would otherwise be going won't be ready in time because they're going to restart production after the virus clears. Um, so I guess what I would say is look for the second wave of festivals after everything gets back up and running here, when the backlog of films that were going to go to, to South by and Tribeca uh, get played, and then you will be uh, moving into a vacuum and your the relative, um, uh, you know, uh, I guess value of your film will increase. Thanks. I have a different question here from Veronica Miles, and it's really about more about uh, the creative and content part of uh, filmmakings. And she's asking, what trends are you seeing today in the types of stories being told and storytellers behind the camera, such as more films by women and people of color? What do oh. we need more of and what are buyers looking for? Well, there's been a weird um, flip in the last few years, at least at Sundance. Um, and that is that the documentaries have been more commercial, have been, uh, have spawned more heated sales than the features. Now, if you've got a film like Palm Springs, you know, every once in a while, I guess that's the version, this year's version of Little Miss Sunshine. If, if you have a, a rollicking comedy with Andy Samberg or, or movie stars, then you can go to Sundance and sell it, but you could also sell that at Toronto or anywhere else. Sundance is primarily a festival of discovery. And what I think is, is happening now is that the documentaries are creating more heat than the scripted features. Um, and so uh, I would, uh, you know, I, I, I happen to love documentaries and I've been working in them for a long time, so I'm very happy about that. Um, I think. The problem with scripted features is that, you know, if you look at the performance of the purely indie films that came out of Sundance in the last few years, they haven't done that well. I mean, so Amazon will go and buy films with movie stars for lots of monies like they did two years ago, uh, or, or Apple bought the Andy Samberg, but uh, the, the scripted discovery films have really had a hard time finding homes. Uh, and well, at the same time, places like Netflix and Amazon and um, are green lighting for production more of those smaller films. So in a way, uh, ra it seems like the, 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 the greater opportunities come from trying to get your films financed by those platforms. You know, something that people don't realize, and it, it's been upended by um, coronavirus, but Netflix content budget for 2020 is 17 billion dollars um, and when you look at all the platforms that are chasing netflix uh you realize that there's more money for the creation of content than there's ever been um, and i would really try to lean into that um, either that or see you know make your film as inexpensively as possible and and you know gird yourself to uh to use that film as a resume film uh, to get you know paid to make your second film because it's very hard these days the odds are against smaller scripted movies um thank you can i i, I think i want to just make sure that um veronica's question is fully answered because she's she's asking uh don't forget she's asking um what do you think about women and people of color in terms of opportunities that are are there more opportunities for them uh, now have, basically have things changed or are they yes i there's no question that things have changed um they've certainly changed in directing episodics um uh you know there's been a huge uh shift in diversity um you know, that is true to a certain extent at the studios, but in, in episodic TV, it's absolutely true. And I think in front of the camera, I think, I think um, that, you know, the actor, there's a much more diverse array of actors um, working these days. So, um, yeah, I think that's, um, okay. that's a given. Thank you. 
Uh, I have a very producer kind of question from producer Jonathan Burkhardt. And he's asking, sorry, he's asking, is there a budget range that you see as a sweet spot or best as a safe place to make money back as in say under 10 million, 5 million or under 3 million? Yeah, I mean, honestly, if you have no uh, cast, um, uh, you know, significant cast, uh, unless, even if it's genre, if you look at someone like Jason Blum is making films, still making films under 3 million, certainly under 5 million. If, you, if you're making a drama uh, or something that's entirely execution dependent without any name talent, I think you're being irresponsible to make it for more than 3 million. Um, unless you're an established filmmaker. And of course, you've got to make it somewhere where there's a tax credit. Um, maybe three million is a little low, but it just, uh, I would be careful about that. I think in a weird way, documentaries are more reliable. And I'm sorry, I'm always touting documentaries here, but if you can make a documentary on a commercial subject that hasn't been beaten to death um, for under a million, uh, you're gonna be in better shape than a, than uh, even a, you know, a good script of a scripted independent film for three million. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going um, to a different question now, and that's from another producer, Todd Remis, who says, first of all, hi, Mira and John. And then he's asking, <laughs> he's asking you, um, what advice would you give to filmmakers who have a film that was accepted to South by or Tribeca and are now screening virtually or any filmmaker with a completed film should the film wait and try to play at festivals when they resume in the future or, or try to be sold now? I mean, I know I'm not making friends with uh, my friends at Tribeca, but I would really resist screening. If your film was in Tribeca, I would really resist screening it virtually as part of the festival. I, I would realize, you know, it may be that but buyers are going to, what? Explain, explain why. Because it's just not the best, now is not the right time when buy. first of all, theatrical buyers are terrified because the theaters aren't open and the platforms are, are going to need a few weeks, you know, three or four weeks before they start to get nervous and realize they're going to, like I said before, going to be short on product. And, you know, screening something virtually like that isn't necessarily the best way to screen it. Um, I, would, I would take the advice of an experienced sales agent who might understand that maybe you screen it one by one, um, maybe you wait for, to, for a festival in the future. Like I said, the festivals in the fall and winter could really, um, have a shortage of, of um, submissions because of all the stuff that stopped production. So I, I know the festivals benefit from virtual screenings. I'm not sure the filmmakers do. Okay. I hope I'm not going to I hope the Woodstock Film Festival is not going to have to uh, resort to that. I do too. <laughs> um, we are nearing the end, so I may not be able to get to some of the questions still left here, but I really would like to so you kind of like put your crystal ball glasses on and talk how you think the future of, um, in the, of filmmaking and I mean film production, film consumption, con consumption. How do you see that this, you know, un uh, uh, unparalleled, time that we are all living through now is going to shape or reshape how we make and how we watch films. I mean, look at it, it, that's obviously the $64,000 question. I mean, I think the theaters will come back. I think people have a lot of vested interest in, in making the theaters come back. Um, and hopefully the, the, uh, the federal, um, uh, Relief Act or whatever, Stimulus Act as they call it, uh, will help enable them to stay in business until they can reopen. Um, the I don't think there's any question that 
the blockbusters, you know, the the uh, superhero movies and the, the films that are visceral and and that viscera is a, is is an element of of the view of the viewer experience uh, will survive and maybe even thrive. And I think for a while there will be a hardcore you know art house uh, constituency that will keep those going. I'm concerned about the films in the middle that um, you know that are being made uh, both by the studio sometimes and the independent distributors, but more and more by the platforms. And I think those films more and more are going to recede uh, from theatrical toward the platforms. And you know, I mean, I've fought for years, these filmmakers who said, my film has to be shown in public, it has to be shown on a giant screen. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people who did themselves a disservice by insisting that. But I, but I, I would be lying if I said I, I'm, I won't miss seeing films, you know, I, that way. I, I, films that are up for the Academy, I always see in theaters. I don't watch them on screeners if I'm considering them seriously. Um, I don't watch films on planes. There's something about, you know, a theatrical experience that really means something to me, but I think, you know, I may be a bit of a dinosaur in that regard. And, you know, while there's more money than there's ever been for, for content, and while, you know, people have gigantic television screens, maybe the idea of making something directly for Netflix or for a platform is not the worst thing in the world. And I, and I work with filmmakers who are more and more coming to that conclusion. Okay. Well, um, as we near the end, I want to read, um, not, a, not a question, but a comment uh, from Veronica Miles, who says, uh, thank you so much, John and Meira. The answers have been excellent, inspiring, and helpful. Best webinar I have seen during quarantine. So... <laughs> I don't know how uh, many really, well, I've seen, but I've been told I've been I've been told that if you if you like this, you should follow me on social media. That's, right. oh, That's good, what good. people I work with told me to make a plug. But thank you very much. That is a very kind uh, statement. So uh, on this note, I want to thank everybody who joined us uh, on uh, Zoom and Facebook Live. I want to thank John Sloss. Um, he's um, amazing producer and i hope that some of you uh at attending here will get to work with him he's incredible and uh join us this coming thursday we're doing another webinar with this time with editors kate Sanford and brian Gates, who cut um the marvelous mrs mazel so we're going to talk about that be sure to say hi to kate for me i haven't seen her in a long time and she's one of my favorites uh, she's she's fantastic, and as as is her husband, who's also an editor, Gary. Um, the well, there we go. And Mayra, thank you so much. You're a great host. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you're you're a guest. Uh, you're a wonderful panelist. Uh, so thank you all very much. Have a good rest of the evening. We'll see you next time. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>